cultural questions. That's why I decided to do the economics of it. It's the cultural questions. Let me say that. Social capital. One of the things that uh, Linda really taught me was not to be afraid of who you are. It's hard sometimes when you come from places like Baltimore, or South Side of Chicago, or Daytona Beach, Florida, to be true to yourself when you're in a place like Cambridge, Massachusetts. I, if, if that's not clear, I'm sorry, but that, that's, that's the way I felt about it. And on two dimensions, Linda did this for me. One, she made it okay to, to have common sense, right? Because in economics, sometimes you're supposed to throw out everything and be totally objective. And that's fine, because I remember and there's this trick in economics, which you try to make it seem like it's a puzzle. Right? I remember sitting in seminars with Linda, and someone would say, I'm going to study the effects of growing up with a teen mother. It could be bad, or it could be good. And Linda was like, no, it's not as bad. <laughs> I said, I don't care what data you got. That's not bad at me. The last seminar I gave, uh, and Linda was in the back of the room, and at Brown, there was a debate that was happening with one of Glenn's colleagues about whether or not kids understand the production function. What I mean by that is whether or not a seven-year-old understands the how the vector of all their actions is going to translate into outcomes in 20 years. And we were having a debate about this. <laughs> and finally, Linda jumped in after two or three minutes and said, of course they don't know it. Please. Have you ever had kids? Were you a kid? <laughs> Again, I wanted to be objective, so I said, I just believe what Linda says. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that on social capital, that she allowed it to be okay with you was her laugh. Right? And again, these things don't sound like much to you, but they meant a lot to me. And you know, you, you come up, you go through graduate school, you get into the cocktail parties, you know, the Society of Fellows, you get into the cocktail parties and people tell a joke and you, oh, that was funny. <laughs>
take a bite of a sandwich, I again put down my next issue I had with Lynn. My point is, she sat there for 35 or 40 minutes and listened. She never said a word. It's not like what I was saying was untrue. Lynn was tough on me. But she said, you're lucky to have her. And she never minced a word. She refused to even acknowledge that I was saying something wrong, that her husband could have something, some issues, and I wanted to point them out. And I always respected her for that. I went there on a mission. I wanted her to feel sorry for me. And she said, you are so, so lucky to have him in your life. And I am lucky to have had both of them. And my only real regret is to be very frank that I didn't take the time to tell her all this. We all had it easy. 
If it was bad for us with our thesis advisors to help us in their ready made social networks, what is it like for everyone else? And that's where Linda and also Jans come in. They tell us exactly how other people cope uh, insofar as they do with one of the greatest worries in their lives. Their study of networks and what people do begins where the um, uh, economics of unemployment should begin. How do people cope and what are the consequences of how they do? Their joint paper goes then to the human level beyond the standard labor and macroeconomics, which says that unemployed people apply to job vacancies and there's a probability that they'll get a job. Um, but then the important thing is what's the human side to all of that probability? And Linda and Giannis emphasize the role that's played by people's social networks. And with these uh, roles played by the social and informational networks, that's where a great deal of the tension of finding a job comes in. The last thing that most of us want to do is to utilize our networks to contract strangers or near strangers to have them help us get a job. But then, beyond the worry that's involved, there's also the unfairness. We had our thesis advisors, but what do those other people have? They, so Linda and Giannis have explored a major factor uh, then not just in the sleep that lost at night, but also in the basic unfairness and inequity in our economy. Now, just as Linda and Giannis have focused on unemployment and how people who are unemployed look for jobs, Linda throughout her career has focused on the other worries that we have. Now, one of the greatest worries each of us has is, as a parent, how much attention should we pay to our kids? And um, there are two theories about this. There's the Weed School of Thought, which says that children go out best with relatively little intervention. In contrast, there's the Hothouse School, which says that every need should be attended. There's a book by um, Annette Leroux called Unequal Childhood that's compared the, the styles of modern middle class parents to lower middle class um, parents in places like Boston. And she demonstrates the overattention of the middle class to their children and also the lack of attention that by the lower middle class. Curiously, Linda has shown that both types of parents were doing the right things um, given those skills. Why? Because college educated parents' kids have higher earnings the more attention they get, but non-college educated parents' kids get the same or lower earnings. But we should have before focus on the unfairness that, that leads to. If we want to have an equitable society in which people really are equal, we should mute the advantage of the rich and the elite by a public school system for everyone that is as good as the private school system and the rich neighborhood school system that for the elite as we know. Then, switching gears slightly, Linda and David Gorman have two tremendously subtle papers that look at whether selective schools are good uh, for our kids. We all worry about our kids and where they go to college. Do selective schools really make a difference? They find that they do. They find that selective schools help whites, but they also help blacks more. That's the good news. But then they also find that there's also some bad news. They find that there's very well, a worry regarding a side effect of affirmative action. And that's how they interpret that when adjusted for GPA and also for dropout rates, the effect of black earnings from selected college is mutual. Let me take another example from another Linda study. Her work is full of concern that people's networks affect their life chances. And again, she's worried about the unfairness of it all. A significant fraction of the gap between African American and and white can be explained by differences in family background. But when you look at the earnings condition on neighborhood, a considerable amount of those family background effects go away. Where you grow up seems to matter to who you become and how you fare in American society. Maybe we are all free to choose, but we do not get to choose from the same tray. And that affects who we all become. So I've taken more time than I was allotted but uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. In conclusion, I want to note the following. I want to note that Linda's economics reflected the person that we so very much admire. Her economics is about real people. It's about real people with real worries in real time. And it reflects the 
the love and the good service that she had for all of us. And we all miss her. We miss her.